greetings in the precious name of Jesus. In our Revelation series, to which I welcome you very warmly, we are now in chapter 3. And uh, we are moving on to my third book in our Revelation series. And here the first church that we are going to discuss today, the Church of Sardis, is entitled The Boring Church of Sardis by Me. Okay? Now why we call it a boring church, you will know when we uh, study through the message the Lord Jesus has given to this church. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 3 and uh, may we read the first six verses. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know thy works that thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before thy, my father. And before his angels, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. My dear friends, if you are following my teachings properly, you would have made a chart for yourselves in discussing the seven churches. And pull it out and let's start filling in the columns of this fifth church that we are talking about. Okay? Sardis. Let me tell you about the little town, not too far from Smyrna, a very famous ancient town. In fact, uh, Sardis was the place where uh, in uh, human history uh, we have records of the first coins being uh, melted, you know, minted rather, the first coins. And also you remember Xerxes of the Old Testament during the time of uh, Daniel? He was there for some time from where he waged war against uh, his enemies. And uh, we also know that it was a hilly, slightly hilly place and uh, very famous for its uh, jewelry and his, it, its uh, uh, clothes. Now two, two enterprises were abounding in Sardis. Number one, jewelry. In those days, people... Uh, came to Sardis to buy jewelry, gold, silver, bronze, and various precious stones. And also that was a place where a lot of clothes were manufactured. So it was a commercial sort of place, not as rich as Corinth or Ephesus, but not as poor as some of the other cities that we have seen. Uh, quite similar to Smyrna, I would say. You remember when we talked about Smyrna, they were okay, mid, upper middle class people, because they were uh, trading with myrrh. And uh, Sardis also was a, a place like Samana, where the people were all in the upper middle class level, where they were not really poor, uh, they were not hyper rich, but then they were not uh, struggling for money. And uh, quite busy because of its commerce. And uh, that's where this church uh, existed which receives an interesting message of Jesus. Now, in our first column, then you would write the name of the church, and in the next column, you would uh, inscribe the description of the giver, Jesus. How is Jesus described? These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Now, the seven spirits of God doesn't mean that there are seven uh, uh, Holy Spirits, seven spirits. I would want to, on this point, uh, draw your attention 
to Isaiah chapter 11. Okay. A prophecy about Jesus' first coming when he would be born. And uh, I will uh, read from verse 1 and let's, let's talk about uh, verse 2 which talks about the sevenfold spirit. Now we must understand that the seven spirits here in Revelation does not mean seven spirits but a sevenfold spirit. Okay. Isaiah chapter 11 verse 1. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. And a branch shall grow out of his roots. A very clear description of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 2. <clears throat> and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and might. The spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Okay, there are the seven things. Let me... Let me count as I say this. Okay, number one. And the spirit of the Lord. Okay, spirit of the Lord is number one. Okay, shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom, number two. The spirit of understanding, number three. The spirit of counsel, number four. The spirit of might, number five. The spirit of knowledge, number six. And of the, the spirit of the fear of the Lord, number seven. Now that's the sevenfold spirit Jesus had when he was born on this earth. And here Jesus is in Revelation 3, Jesus is reminding that, that he is the one who has the sevenfold spirit. What did he do with the sevenfold spirits, spirit when he had the spirit when he was a human? It was through that Holy Spirit that he gave regeneration to those who believed him. Without the spirit, the people would not receive regeneration. Why? Because Jesus himself said, unless you are born in water and spirit, you shall not enter the kingdom of God. So my dear friends, the Holy Spirit, which was on Jesus, made him do all what he did when he was on earth. And here Jesus is reminding about that. Now he has the sevenfold spirit and the seven stars. We know from Revelation 1.20 that the seven stars denote the seven leaders of the church. Then here is a hint of how the church of Sardis was functioning. Perhaps they were messing with the spirit of God. Okay. Also the leadership. Messing with the leadership because Jesus is spoken here as the one who has the sevenfold spirit and the one who is having the seven stars. Okay, now let's go for commendation. Okay, the next column, commendation. I know thy works, that thou hast a name that thou livest. And in that there is this little condemnation, but art dead. Okay. Uh, now the works that they demonstrated was or were very busy works. Not as busy as the message that we saw in the Ephesian church, but uh, they were busy. They, they, they were active people. Let's say active rather than saying busy because uh, the church in Ephesus was busy. They were hyperactive. They were, they were so busy and their problem was they did not do things in love uh, for the Lord, the first love. Whereas here, it's not that they were busy, busy, but they were active. Okay? Wait till we come to the section where we are going to talk about the church history rela relating to the church in Sardis. Quite interesting things were transpiring then. Okay. And thou hast a name that thou livest, but art dead. Now we need to talk about that uh, a little bit more my dear friends the church in Sardis was not going through tumultuous persecution and therefore they could exist as, as a church they could show forth their programs to others they could advertise they could evangelize and they could hold uh, uh, prayer programs, uh, fasting and prayer programs, worship programs, that program, this program and the other. And therefore, 
those who lived around Sardis, you know, in other villages, other towns, may have enviously looked at the church in Sardis thinking, wow, only if we could perform like them, only if we had the freedom to, to do what they are doing. Just like today, my dear friends, you know, I come from Sri Lanka. And in this country, you cannot do everything freely. You cannot go and preach the gospel openly. You can, cannot hold uh, gospel meetings unless through special permission. And also in the cities, you know, where we are, we are in a village, quite difficult to preach the gospel and to hold programs. And when I go to Western countries, uh, they, they grumble and mumble. They grumble. Now, if you are coming from a Western country, you have your reasons to say why you can't preach the gospel and why you can't uh, be open, etc., etc. But I'll tell you, nonetheless, the churches in Europe and the churches in America are gr much more freer than churches in Sri Lanka. And we in Sri Lanka are much more freer than s some of the parts of the world like China, Myanmar, and in some parts of India. So it's quite relative, my dear friends. And uh, when, when, when I, a Sri Lankan pastor, look at the freedom Europe has, freedom, the, not, not Europe, the European church, okay, and the church in America has, sometimes I think, my goodness, if, if only I had that freedom, I could do wonders, you know. On the same token, the neighboring cities of Sardis were enviously looking at Sardis for the freedom they had to function as a church and the many programs that they could run as a church without having to go through all the problems that the others were facing in other cities. And therefore there was a name. Uh, nominally they were alive, just like many churches today. If you look at their church calendar, you can see, uh, boy, they have a Tuesday prayer meeting, Wednesday ladies meeting, Thursday young men's uh, meeting, Friday all night prayer, f Saturday fasting, Sunday morning church, late morning church, evening church. And, uh, you know, you can see programs, okay, programs. And uh, social work and uh, a church could appear to be very active. But sometimes they may not have the life. Maybe a lot of active churches today don't have life. Why? Because they don't have the spirit. Not all active churches. But if you see an active church, don't jump into a conclusion thinking that that's a fine running church. Sometimes they may have all these programs, but not the spirit. Let's come to that in a minute. Let, let us go to the next section. Verse 2. Counsel. Jesus is counseling them. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. I did a lot of study ab about this particular verse. What was Jesus talking about? Be watchful. Okay, fine. And strengthen the things which remain. Well, what things did remain in Sardis? And when I investigated, what I found out was staggering. It was the word of God. The only thing that remained in that church at that point, ready to die, was the word of God. Okay? The Lord is so interested in his word. Because today, my dear friends, programs, events are overtaking the word of God. In many churches, not everywhere. By God's grace, many of you come from churches that preach the word of God and give prominence to the word of God. But there are so many other churches, so many other places where programs and events have largely overtaken the word of God. One of the things that has overtaken the word of God is the anointing, especially in Pentecostal charismatic churches. Now, I am a Pentecostal charismatic pastor and therefore I, I, I am not talking bad about this anointing and everything. But today, emotionalism has overtaken the word of God to a large extent in many Pentecostal churches. 
I am all for the experience. I am all for the emotions. Why? We are emotional beings, right? It is nice to experience the power of God. Look, when I became a Christian in 1979, the first thing that happened to me when I went to the church, I, I got saved on a Friday. Okay, I got saved on a Friday. And uh, a week later, on a Saturday, I went to the church for the first time. And the first thing that happened to me was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I started to speak in tongues. I didn't know that speaking in tongues existed. Nobody taught me that. I hadn't seen Christians pray. I hadn't walked into a church unknown to any of the Christian, Christian phenomena. I was for the first time in my life in a church when the Lord baptized me in the spirit and I spoke in tongues. And boy, that experience was so wonderful. And after that, I laid my, uh, the pastor told me to go and lay my hands on people, which I did. And they also experienced the same experience that I experienced. So I am all for these wonderful experiences, the emotions starting from my early Christian days, okay? And that was 1979 and now we are in 2015 and I still am a hardcore Christian Pentecostal charismatic pastor. But none of the experiences, none of the emotions should overtake the word of God. But quite sadly, it has happened in many Pentecostal churches. The experiences are wonderful. The emotional stirring ups are wonderful. And because of that, many people have run behind experiences and emotions, leaving behind the word of God. And the Lord Jesus is admonishing the church in Sardis saying, look, you have so many programs, okay? You, you are an active church, but that's for the outside world. They look at you and they say that you are alive. But as for me, you are as good as dead. You are dead. Dead to what? Dead to the word of God. What remains is just a little bit of the word and hold on to that. That's what the Lord is saying. He is referring to the word when he says what he says in verse 2. Okay? For I have not found thy works perfect before God. My dear friends, None of us is perfect and therefore none of our programs is going to be perfect. What then did Jesus say when he said, uh, I have not found thy works perfect before God? This is what he says. Whatever you do, may what you do be backed by the word of God. However interesting, attractive, fruitful, the program might be, make it backed by the word of God. And today, in many Pentecostal charismatic churches, a lot of experiences are there, a lot of emotions are there, a lot of things entitled anointing are there, but most of them are not backed by the word of God. Many people see visions that are not backed by the word of God. Many people claim to have dreamt dreams that are quite contrary to the word of God. There are so many people in the world now who claim to have gone to heaven. And they say, I went to heaven, I saw the father. And not too long ago, an Indian preacher said that he and his wife were in Jerusalem. And the father himself descended to meet them. Now these are quite contrary to the word of God. Okay, And I was listening to another uh, Indian uh, preacher, a very famous one. And he was saying that uh, he knows of a person who is living in uh, Tibet uh, and he's uh, over 400 years now because Jesus came and try, took his heart away and put a new heart and said, you are going to live till I come. Now these are quite anti-biblical things. They are not supported by the Bible. But there are people who having heard these things, scream and yell, wow, praise the Lord, amen, hallelujah. And then I saw some, some people trying to demonstrate the power of God on stage. You know, there was this guy who 
uh, drew a hypothetical line with his uh, foot and he said, this is the line of the Holy Spirit. Now you guys try cross and come to me. And when those guys came, they, uh, they, they, they demonstrated as if they, they hit a wall and they fell. You know, these are all quite anti-biblical stuff. They're not substantiated with the Bible. And that is why we need to be very careful that these works are not perfect. Any work is made perfect if only backed by the word of God. Are you with me? If you have gifts, if you have uh, uh, the abilities to perform miracles, signs and wonders, wonderful. I believe in them all. But make sure that whatever you do are backed by the word of God for it only when it's backed by the word of God that the work becomes perfect in the sight of God. Things that are not backed by the word of God may be attractive to people. People may just come flocking into your church, but then it's not perfect. The church in Sardis was like that. Their work was not perfected by the word of God. Okay, my dear friends, now let's go to verse 3. Remember, therefore, here's the counsel again, how thou hast received and heard. How you got the word. Okay, he's talking about the word. And hold fast and repent. Remember how you heard the word. Hold fast to the word and repent and come back to that word. The word repentance here doesn't mean repent for salvation. Okay, it doesn't talk about salvation. It's talking about repenting to the word. There are two repentances, my dear friends. In fact, three, but let me talk about the main two. The first repentance is when we repent of our sins and accept Jesus as our personal savior. Okay, that's our first repentance. And after that, we need to live a life that would make us repent from time to time as we know that we have errors uh, in light of the scripture. So repenting to the word of God. When we learn things that we hitherto have not known, then we repent and come back to the word of God. Okay, Start doing things according to the word of God and stop, stop doing things that are contrary to the word of God. So we need to live a life of constant repentance. The more we learn the word, the more we repent. And the more we repent, the more we are purified. And the more we are purified, the more we become the people of the word of God. Okay? That's the repentance. Of course, there's this third kind of repentance where we repent when we commit uh, sins and mistakes. Anyway, here the repentance is of the second kind where the Lord says, you remember how you heard the word and then hold fast to the word and repent to stand firm on that word. Okay? If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. My dear friends, have you seen the movie called uh, Thief in the Night? A beautiful movie made in the 70s. Boy, I'll tell you, I remember watching the movie in 1979. Uh, the movie uh, highlights on what will happen after rapture. And uh, we were all panic-stricken because we were scared when we uh, watched that movie. It was a good movie, but it's now very outdated. Uh, they, they, they borrowed the, the title from the scripture where Jesus himself says in several occasions, uh, I will come as a thief in the night. Now, some hardcore Pentecostal people would uh, interpret that literally and think that Jesus comes at night. Now, we must understand that the world is a globe, and uh, if it is night to one place, it's daytime to another. And I don't think uh, rapture is going to take place only at night. It will happen at one point, one moment, and at that moment, somewhere it will be night, somewhere it will be evening, somewhere it will be morning. But uh, the reason why Jesus says that he will come as a thief in the night is uh, to show that the time is not known. Jesus very very clearly said, he said, the, the, the coming of my, uh, the rapture actually, you know, when we talk about uh, Revelation eventually after we uh, finish chapter 3, we will talk about the rapture in detail 
and uh, wh whether we are pre-tribulational, mid-tribulational, post-tribulational or whatever. Uh, you know, rapture, nobody knows when it will happen. It can happen today, it can happen 50 years from now. And uh, today, unfortunately, we know that so many people are very highly caught up with uh, some events and they tie those events with the rapture, the end times, and they start giving promising dates. They said, you know, Jesus will come in 1982. He never came. He, then they said Jesus will come in 1996. He didn't come. Then people said he will come in 2007. He didn't come. Then uh, in 2012, May 27th, boy, somebody in America, they were advertising and they said Jesus is coming. He didn't come. And uh, now this is 2015. I'm talking this on the 2nd of October. And just a few days ago on the 28th was the final uh, blood moon. And uh, people said that that's when Jesus was going to come. And Jesus didn't come. And I am still recording on the 2nd of October. Now, I am not somebody who dismisses the signs that the Lord has promised in the scripture. But I am very careful in uh, trying not to read too much into these signs and start predicting dates. Of course, we live in the last days. I believe that we live in the last days. But then how do you define last days? In our terms or in God's terms? In God's terms. And if we say, Lord, how many days are there for you to come? He'll say, maybe one or two. Oh, so you're going to come in one or two days. And then he'll say, yeah, yeah, because one day is like thousand years to me. Oh, boy. Then he's talking about one or two thousand years. So in God's terms, we are in the last days. And uh, wait till we come to the Laodicean church period when I'm going to talk about uh, the last days, the last uh, segment of the seven, you know, I told you the seven churches are divided into seven church eras. We do live in the last church era, the Laodicean church era. And uh, it started about 115 years ago already. And therefore, last days, we don't know how to define last days. Although I believe that we are living in the last days. And... Uh, uh, yes, the world is being prepared for the coming of the Antichrist and everything, blah, 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 dad, 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 wonderful. But don't try to read too much into those things. For Jesus has said, I will come as a thief in the night. Nobody would know. The thief never advertises his coming, okay? And there is another meaning to that also. A thief usually comes to rob. And here in this Sardis church context, Jesus uh, is not giving them a a positive connotation about his return. He's not saying, I will come, I will come at a time that you don't know. He, he doesn't say in that positive manner. He's saying, hey, if you don't repent, I will come as a thief in the night. And now that, that has an abstract meaning also. He says, I will come to take things away because a thief comes to take, take things away. And I believe the Lord is referring to two things. He's referring to two things, my dear friends. Jesus is saying, if you don't repent, I will come and I will remove, number one, the spirit. Number two, the word. And that has happened. That has happened. You know, when we talk about the Laodicean church period, I'm going to talk about the differences between, or the main difference between the mainline churches and the Pentecostal churches. Okay? And uh, I will tell you... Uh, slightly what I'm going to be talking about because what I see here needs mentioning. Jesus did what he promised to the church in Sardis. He removed the spirit from the mainline churches. The mainline churches do have the word but they don't have the spirit. And he removed the word from the Pentecostal churches. Many Pentecostal churches have the spirit but they don't have the word. Both conditions are equally dangerous. And we will talk about these in detail when we talk about the Laodicean church. So don't jump into conclusions in saying that Suresh is saying that the mainline churches don't have the spirit and that uh, Suresh is saying that the Pentecostal churches don't have the word. For we know many mainline churches have got the spirit and many Pentecostal churches have got the word. 
Wait till we talk about the Laodicean church period when I will really explain what I am talking about. But here at this point, all what we need to remember is that the Lord saying, now if you don't repent and come back to the word, I will come to you as a thief in the night when you don't know and then I will take from you some goodies and the two goodies of a church which need not, should not be removed are the word and the spirit. Okay, I will come upon thee. Now verse 4. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. Garments and raiments symbolically mean righteousness. And here, in this context, Jesus is saying, now although most of you people are active, but then your garments are dirty because you are not righteous. You are not living according to the word. Not to say that there are some people who are clean who are good. There is this remnant in your church. And uh, he's commending that. He's saying, yeah, there are those who are in the word. Okay. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. And again, many Pentecostal churches have taken these things very literally, and they start wearing white. And I know that uh, uh, in our Sri Lanka, a church started uh, as early as 1920s, a church called the Ceylon Pentecostal Mission. Oh boy, their commitment is huge. But one of the big mistakes they committed is that they taught that everybody should wear white. And uh, many churches in India, many churches in Africa, and many churches in other parts of the world teach that you need to wear white because white is the, the, the color of the garment, Jesus says, that uh, he will uh, make you wear. And uh, for, for us who really try to uh, exegete the, the book of Revelation, we know that uh, in fact white here doesn't mean uh, white color, but it means purity, okay, pure. Okay, the, they shall walk with me in white means they, they, they will be clothed with righteousness, clothed in righteousness for they are worthy. Okay, white means um, righteousness. Now, verse 5. The promise to the overcomer. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, of which we have spoken about. White raiment actually means uh, righteousness. Okay, And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Now look at this, my dear friends. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. Book of Life. Now I have a different message entitled, uh, entitled God's Books. In Malachi chapter 3 and verse 16 we'll see a book of remembrance is there in, in the presence of God. And this is the Lamb's Book of Life. And the Lamb's Book of Life is a symbolical expression to, uh, to say that these, these, these people will live eternally with Jesus. Okay? It's a symbolical meaning. And uh, symbolically talking, when we become Christians by accepting our Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior and Lord, our names are jotted, written on the Lamb's Book of Life. Okay? Because we are saved and from that moment onwards, we are able to go to heaven. But the Lord Jesus says that there is the possibility of the name being blotted out of the book of life. Do you see that? The possibility is there for the name to be blotted out. Now that tells me that once saved, always saved is not a true doctrine. It also says that there is no uh, eternal security. Now we know that John Calvin taught uh, a very attractive teaching uh, which we call Calvinism. One of the aspects of Calvinism is that if you get saved, you will never lose your salvation. And if somebody lost the salvation, then they would say that person never got saved in the first place. Now, I see in my personal life how some people get saved. They leave their Hindu religion, their Buddhist religion or whatever. 
and they truly become Christians. Some even become ministers. And I know, I know of a handful of people who have left God and gone back to that. And uh, since I know them, I know that when they got saved, they were, not re- they were not playing the fool. They really got saved. And here in the eastern part of the world, uh, we have to deal with demons and a lot of spirits and uh, a lot of persecution. And I have seen people losing their jobs, losing their families, losing a lot uh, to become Christians. And then they are ardent followers of Jesus for, uh, for a number of years. And then they started to sway away from God all the way to the extent where they leave Christianity and go to become what they were before. And Jesus himself is saying that. You know, Jesus himself says when a spirit leaves uh, somebody, uh, the the spirit would go into arid places and uh, having found no place to rest would come back to this house and then uh, come with uh, seven more spirits to endure. So Jesus is hinting from time and again that somebody could lose the salvation. Now in saying so, I'm not saying that, uh, you know, we are are frail people, we have weaknesses. And there is not a single day that I don't repent when I pray before going to bed because there are so many things that we do wrong in our words, in our deeds, in our thoughts. And uh, there are so many mistakes uh, and sins that we commit. And I'm not here to say that we lose the salvation every time we commit a mistake, right? Uh, Sin for me is, uh, I mean, when I say for me, it's biblical. What I see in the Bible is things that you do that are displeasing to God and things that you don't do that are pleasing unto God. And every time you commit a sin, you lose your salvation and then you have to get saved again. No, 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 I'm not talking about that. But uh, there are things that if you do, For example, you denounce Jesus, you denounce God, you become so ungodly and you become, uh, you you go back to another religion, you you, you say God doesn't exist, you you deny the word of God and if that condition occurs, then uh, the uh, the chance is that that person is lost his or her salvation. And if people argue in favor of Calvinism saying, that if you are saved, you will never lose your salvation. You are secured eternally. Then I have a question as to what Jesus is talking about here. Because Jesus is mentioning the possibility of one's name uh, could be blotted out of the Lamb's book of life. Okay? And Jesus is admonishing the church in Sardis. Saying, now you better get back to the word. You better get back to the spirit. And you repent, for if not, I will block out your name from the book of life. Your names are written, but I will block them out. Are you with me? So that's what Jesus is saying. But if you overcome, then I will confess your name before my Father and before his angels. Because Jesus said, if you if you uh, confess me in front of your people, then I will confess you in front of the Father. Okay, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now in our final column, my dear friends, we will talk about uh, the history of the church in relation to the Sardis church era. And the Sardis church era commences in 1520 and runs all the way to 1790. And that's the era that we would call the Reformation. Okay, and uh, we know what happened during the Reformation. Pope Leo X was the Pope in the 16th century. And uh, a a young boy uh, who was born to a very ardent uh, Roman Catholic family studied to become a lawyer. And then uh, he not only became a lawyer, but also he became a monk. He became a priest in the Wittenberg University Chapel. And he is none other than Martin Luther. And Martin Luther was a very ardent follower of Catholicism. And uh, he was a little bit disturbed uh, over what Pope Leo X had done uh, in the sales of indulgences. Remember I told you about uh, the sales of indulgences of uh, the Roman Catholic Church where you could purchase beforehand the 
the sales of indulgences uh, and, and so if you commit a mistake, a, a sin against the Catholic Church, you can pay those uh, tickets and get away with it. Okay, And he was uh, quite a bit uh, perturbed over that because back in Rome, Pope Leo X needed to complete the, the, the St. Peter's uh, Dome. He needed uh, a lot of money in the Vatican. And that was why the sales of indulgences were uh, very much promoted uh, to the extent where Martin Luther was disturbed. And once uh, Martin Luther decided to visit Rome and he undertook the pilgrimage starting from Wittenberg. He went down to the south of Germany and then through, the, through Switzerland into Italy and then he made his way to Rome. And every time he stayed overnight in a monastery, he saw that the further south he went, that the monasteries were becoming more modern, more comfortable and more luxurious. And by the time he reached Rome, he was completely fed up because he didn't see the ardency, the commitment, the, the simple life that he and the people he knew in, back in Germany uh, experienced. The Catholics, the, the, the Pope and the priests were all having a very luxurious life. And when he returned back to Wittenberg, he was a little bit perturbed. And uh, he, he was well versed with uh, Greek. And therefore he laid his hands on a Greek Bible. Now up until then, they were reading uh, the Vulgate, the Latin version of the Bible translated by Jerome the Church Father in 404 AD. And for the first time he started reading his Bible in Greek and what did he come across? He started reading in Romans, uh, the just shall live by faith. And it was a new phenomenon for him. Wow, I have never seen this. And then he started reading the word in, uh, reading the New Testament in uh, Greek. And then he came out with 95 theses that were completely different, contrary to the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. And uh, he posted the 95 theses on the Wittenberg Church door. And he said, anyone who walks through these doors into my chapel should believe these 95 theses, if not, don't come. And then uh, it became a big problem. And the Roman Catholic Church labeled him as a protester, protesting against the Roman Catholic norms. And that's how the pro they were, began to be called the Protestants. Okay, the first Protestant church was the Lutheran Church, which even today exists. Okay, now my dear friends, Simultaneously, a man called Zwingli, who didn't have any relationship with Martin Luther, he was fed up with something else in Switzerland. He was a man from Switzerland and he brought reformation in Switzerland. Then we know John Calvin, John Knox in Scotland, John Calvin in England. These people quite simultaneously and then a guy called Christian IV in Scandinavia. You know, these people brought reformation around the same time in Europe. Now, I believe that the hand of the Lord was in this. This was not something which sparked by one individual called Martin Luther. The Catholic Church began to say that this guy, he wanted to get married, he wanted to uh, start living a luxurious life and that's why he protested against the Roman Catholic Church. No, 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 no. Simultaneously, God raised up people from various countries to stand against the hitherto functioning Roman Catholic Church and go back to the Word. And my dear friends, this happened in 1526. The, 19, uh, the 95 theses were posted on uh, in uh, 1526. What happened? The world began to move from its Roman Catholic priests, uh, precepts into Reformation. In other words, as we read in verse uh, 1, that thou hast a name that thou livest. They began to demonstrate life in the church. The church has started to wake up. The church is, has started to resurrect, resurrect, rise again from the dead condition. Okay, But Jesus says, still for all, you are dead. Why? 
even today, my dear friends, the Lutherans have not gone beyond the 95 Theses. Okay? The Anglican Church has not gone beyond that. Of course, Reformation was wonderful. At that time, it brought Renaissance to the world. Wonderful. Uh, you know, the word of God became the norm. And all the traditions, most of the traditions were broken away. And most of the Roman Catholic, the Roman religious ideologies were uh, destroyed. But they, they did not keep on progressing. That was the problem. Reformation brought Renaissance only to a limited period of time. They did not move on from there. Are you with me? And that's why we can very, very, very appropriately uh, apply verse 1 to the historical epoch of 1520 to 1790 because Jesus says, I know thy works, that thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. You are still dead. Now, now people think you are alive, even you think you are alive, but you are still dead. You need uh, to wake up more, you need to rise up more. Do you know that the Roman Catholic Church forbade, um, it had forbidden reading of the Bible uh, by the lay people earlier on. But in 1546, the year Martin Luther died, they added six more books to the Catholic Bible and that is why today in the Roman Catholic Bible we have 72 books over against the regular 66 books of the Bible. It was during this period my dear friends that the Jesuit order was formed of the uh, Roman Catholic Church and today in 2015 we have Pope Francis the first Jesuit Pope uh, history has ever seen. Anyway uh, the, the, the church era, uh, it was the time when all the churches in Europe were fighting. You know, the Roman Catholics were fighting against the Protestants and the Protestants were fighting against the Roman Catholics. And it was the time when King uh, James of England, uh, he was a bad guy, not a good guy. But then he wanted to please the people and he wanted to give them an English translation of the Bible. And in 1611, the King James Version, the authorized version of the Bible uh, came into existence. But mind you, in English, I would say that the King James Version is the best English translation that we could use because of uh, the number of people who were involved in translating and uh, their commitment and their sacrifice and uh, their ardent faith in the Lord. Le le leave King James alone. He may not be a good guy, but then those translators were all wonderful people. Anyway, my dear friends, I believe the message to the church in Sardis was a blessed one to you. And let's appropriate this message to our own lives too, to our own churches too. If we are active, if we are having program after program, wonderful. But do we have the spirit and the word? Do we have the word backing? Do we have the backing of the word of God to do the things that we are doing? And if not, it's quite a dangerous story. Okay, my dear friends. That brings us to the end of this segment in which we studied the fifth church, the church of Sardis, which I have called the Boring Church. And in our next segment, we are going to look at a wonderful church, the Church of Philadelphia. In two more segments, we'll be finishing chapter 3 and then we'll be stepping into some interesting territory about rapture and what's going to happen after rapture. In the meantime, my dear brothers and sisters, uh, come and join me the next time. Thank you for being with me and bearing uh, with me in this Revelation series. And may God be with you, bless you, lead you and guide you and make you stand firm on his word. Amen. Amen.